Yoshian Cast, the number one sports anime fan podcast on infidelity. My name is Matt, and joining me today is a very special guest, Matt. <laughs> That's like... <laughs> yes, I guess it's relevant if someone <laughs> There are two watched... shows this week that delve into it, Matt. Oh, I guess that's true. Yeah, I guess we're going to talk about anime infidelity. All right. So, with, you know, and if people haven't turned us off already, good for them. Um, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, no, uh, just real quick. We are covering week five of the summer season, covering all sports anime from July 30th to August 5th. Uh, one quick announcement. Uh, we do not have Welcome to the Ballroom this week. Uh, apparently they did not have it this week. The reason why they did the double episode last week was because they had a a scheduled uh, break this week. Because apparently they're, the World Athletics Championship is going on right now. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I it cut into its time slot, basically. That's what a friend of mine told me uh, mm-hmm. who follows a lot of anime. It's like, yeah, a lot of anime actually got canceled to uh, televise the World Athletics Championships. Mm-hmm. Which I thought was... Slightly ironic, considering the uh, the subject matter of our podcast. Oh, look at that. Look at yeah. that. Yeah, well, I brought it home. All right, thanks. Uh, is there any, <laughs> any other announcements, Matt? Uh, not as far as I'm aware. Okay, well, I have a, a question for you. This is the question for, of the week. It comes from a guy named Matt Ely, who also happens to be <laughs> me. Um, and this one is directed towards you. Uh, really? Yeah. So, Matt... Uh, uh, Matt Ely would like to know, what is the most memorable thing you've had to edit out of the podcast? Um, so I think... Something that you can say on air. (laughs) (laughs) Preferably. (laughs) Oh, dear, most memorable thing. Um, gosh, I can't even think of one. So none of them are memorable. Yeah, pretty much. Um, I... Most of what I have to edit out is one of us flubbing one of the summaries. Uh, I think... No, I... Ah, oh, shoot. I just had one. It was one where you were talking... No, it was when we did. were doing Big Wind-Up, and you didn't realize that you had watched the wrong episode. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I had to stop you right there, like, because you had said, like, episode 15, and I corrected you, and you're like, Oh, Matt, uh, don't you mean 14? It's like... No, we watched episode 15, right, man? It's like, no, we didn't. Yeah. Uh, Because the previous week you had written down the wrong episode, even though you had watched the right one. So, yeah, no, that's definitely the most memorable one. Yeah, that was... (laughs) That was a good one. Um, Cool. Well, do you want to dive into the uh, week of anime (laughs) with Dive? Oh, man, I... You, uh, you know, I think I've already in? done the dive pun, but I'm going to forgive you because I'm pretty sure that one was actually unintentional. Yeah, I I, I didn't do that on purpose. It just happened. It, it probably doesn't hurt that the word dive is right on my eye line right now as I'm looking at my notes. So, <laughs> all that being said, uh, so dive episode five and, and focuses on Tomo being kind of freaked out and confused and then frustrated by his friends rejecting him based on the fact that he's getting more attention uh, from Coach Asaki. Uh, He ends up having a conversation, sort of a heart-to-heart with Yoichi, where Yoichi tells him that winning is more important than friendship. Um, You know, a a classic lesson that we all need to learn. Um, And uh, separately, they they discuss um, Okitsu and some of his background, like how his grandfather and father were divers and what his values are and why exactly he dives in the wild way he does. Um, Ultimately, uh, Asaki corrects um, Tomo's friends and tells them the reason that they're that Tomo gets treated specially is because he's the only one who actually exercises outside of the club and does what she told him to. And they say, oh, okay. And then, (laughs) (laughs) and then, uh, ultimately based on, you know, the confidence of everyone around him and his own training, Tomo is able to execute the, uh, three and a half somersault dive. Uh, but after he does so, he goes home and he walks in and his brother meets him at home and 
he tells him, hey, uh, do, do you have a girlfriend, a girl in here? I saw some, you know, there, there were shoes outside that looked like a girl. And he barges into his brother's room and Tomo's girlfriend, Miyu, is sitting there in his brother's room. <laughs> oh, oh, man. So I, I got to say, like, I was I had a very similar reaction to this week's episode as I did the prior weeks. Uh in that I was kind of meh throughout the entire episode, but then it brought it right back around for me at the end. I think the way I would describe this episode is almost saccharine in how it, it's it sort of, de- uh, dis- like, it, it felt like almost a too simple solution for everything that was going on in Tomo's life. Because, oh, yeah, totally. you know, he has that discussion with Yoichi, what I, which I liked, which was about him, you know, like, you know, Yoichi basically giving him some advice, like, hey, man, you know, you... You gotta realize that this is all about winning, like, you, you're kind of undermining what they're going through by just thinking y'all can be friends, and, yeah. you know, Tomo's like, no, but I feel like we can be friends and also compete, and then they come <laughs> back around, and they're like, you're right, we can! <laughs> exactly, um, exactly. I was kind of hoping that they would just turn on him and he wouldn't have friends anymore. Right. And, and he'd like, just have to learn how to deal with, like, oh, what's your priority, you know? Right. But, th- but that's the thing, though, because I felt like it was doing that entirely to undermine that all with the revelation of what's going on with Miu. Mm. Uh, because of the fact, because now he's realizing, oh man, is this what's going on? Like, is this what I actually have to give up in order to, uh, like, in order to kind of pursue this? Because, like, I-, I think what feels very earned to me about this in particular is that it's been set up... Uh, like, throughout the show thus far, that Tomo's not exactly a good boyfriend. Oh, like, yeah. I, he's I mean, terrible. you know, I, yeah, I, he's a junior high boy. It happens. Like, yeah, nobody sure. knows what they're doing in high, junior high. But, right. like, you know, he, that doesn't mean he's a bad kid. You know, he just, he doesn't know how to fulfill this role. Yeah. And he's actually getting some, like, consequences for that. You know, it's, it's kind of a lesson he kind of has to learn. You know, it's a harsh lesson he has to learn. Yeah, it's also that, been established that his brother thinks that Miyu would be better with someone else, and he doesn't understand why she's with Tomo. Right. Um, so it's, you know, also not shocking that he would, you know, have some attraction to her. Um, admittedly, you know, like, I was worried there was going to be a real compromising situation when he oh. opened the door. Uh, it right. was, I think, the, the funniest thing to me was that it appeared <laughs> that they were, like, sitting on opposite sides of the table... <laughs> drinking orange juice and playing playstation yeah like it was almost like you know she was kind of sitting there with like a nice meal and you because you could see like the game controller like on his side so it was clearly like he was like playing games while she was watching i think i think there was two controllers actually oh were there two controllers okay but, but it's either, like... either way it wasn't exactly scandalous <laughs> Right, no. Oh, goodness, no. Again, these are junior high students. They are cheating in the most innocent, pure way that anybody can actually cheat on one another. Yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, no, I played... I drank orange juice with your brother. (laughs) And that's not a euphemism. (laughs) Right, because it's it's like, you know, it's like if you ever walked in on any... Like, you know, on your... On a girlfriend or something like that, doing that nowadays, it'd be like, oh, cool, you guys were playing... Hey, toss me a controller. Get me in this game. Yeah. But yeah, no, I mean, it's like, it's the implication is clear there that, you know, she has, you know, she's kind of fed up with Tomo sort of ignoring her because, you know, she wants somebody who actually likes her. And that's totally understandable. Yeah, like, exactly. But of course she's weeping because how dare she, you know? Right. Well, because, you know, again, again, they're junior high. This is like the biggest thing that could ever possibly happen to them. Yeah. And, and feelings are confusing. Right. Um, there were a co- couple other things I wanted to bring up about this one. Um, first, is, what do you what do you think of Okitsu's backstory? Uh, I'm not big on it, to be honest. Do you want to but... Do you want to explain it briefly? So basically, his family has like I, I I kind of I only kind of gleaned some of it, but effectively, his family has like a tradition, like they 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 uphold a religion where they have to. Um, like, they dive into the ocean to appease some sort of god. Like, it, this is obviously, like, some sort of, like, old tradition that has just been passed down, essentially. Mm-hmm. what they were getting at. 
Like, not something we are actually supposed to be taking seriously. Like, oh no, they, they must appease the diving gods. But yeah. effectively, like, Akitsu's whole thing is that he doesn't like diving in the pool because, you know, he, it was kind of instilled in, onto him uh, as tradition to sort of dive into the ocean. You know, he's sort of being, uh, he's sort of having his way of life encroached. Yeah, uh, it's still not totally clear why he showed up then. Um, right. But it, it's, oh, the thing I liked about it was that, so the way he was trained to dive was it was totally focused on how dramatic you could move in the air. Right. So it was all about what you did in the air, and it didn't really matter how you entered the water. As long as, you know, you, like, didn't land on your back or something, right. it, it, you could have a big splash as long as you were doing amazing things in the air. Um, and the reason he's so insistent on that is because his grandfather was insistent on that, because apparently before 1964, right, uh, there was they didn't the sport did not reward small splashes the way it does now. Where now, like your the way you enter the water is like half of where your points come from, right? Um, and so because of that, you know, his grandfather lost in the Olympics because he was still doing old style dives right. and he lost to people that were doing new style dives so I, I kind of like the fact that his grandfather wouldn't admit that there was anything wrong with his style and just right. taught his grandson no no this is the true way of diving everything else is weak just you know because he lost right right exactly he's kind of passing on his bitterness it's funny too because I actually wrote that down but I actually wrote it that down in a completely different context and I actually wasn't realizing that's what you were getting at because I actually saw that as an interesting moment for Asaki. Like, because the way that, that she sort of reveals this is because, like, Okitsu is less like, oh, you know, it's like, when did, like, when did the, when did the world of diving become so reliant on entry? And she, like, literally just respond, responds. 1964. Yeah, in 1964, <laughs> at, the, at the Olympics, uh, there was an American diver who, like, completely blew everybody's mind with a perfect form. That's why. And I was like, Man, you were just prepped with that little nugget, weren't you? Yeah. Like, I, I, I don't know. I, I thought that was a really, like, it was kind of entertaining, but it also spoke to me very highly about her character, about just how, like, prepared she is to, like, deal with, like, all these different guys or, like, all these different, like, like, it almost feels like she's been through this before with other divers. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, she's had other people being like, oh, well, why are the splashes so... Like, why do people care about my splashes if I'm doing it? It's like, well, this is why. Like, I, I don't know. I, I really liked that moment as a character moment for Asaki. But you're right. It does kind of build on Okitsu's character a little bit more because he's somebody who's been sort of ingrained by tradition. Um, which is interesting, too, now that you mention it. Because that's actually kind of a running theme in this show, I feel like. What do you mean? Um, well, because, like, for example, it's the whole thing with uh, Tomo and why he started going out with Miyu in the first place. He was kind of doing it because he just sort of felt like he was supposed to. Kind of. Like, you mm -hmm. know, these are people... And, like, also with Yoichi, the reason he's even diving in the first place is because he sort of had this responsibility foisted upon him by his father. Uh, so we're kind of getting this whole... You know, everybody's kind of got their own reasons... For being sort of forced into this role, almost. Like, diving has become this only... Like, the only way that these people can even, like, express themselves, it feels like. Hmm. Well, for the record, uh, they didn't allude to him. I just wikipedia would aggressively. And uh, the winner of the 1964 men's 10-meter platform uh, competition was an American named Bob Webster. Oh, okay. Well, they they uh, mentioned that it was an American. Yeah, so that oh. wasn't wasn't made up. Um, <laughs> he had also won in 1960, so I'm not sure if that was clear. But anyway, well, no, um, but I, the the whole point of the story was that that 1964 was when it really changed, was because he yeah. had that dive. Yeah. Uh, so and, he still could have won in 1960 when the when the uh, when the grading scale wasn't quite so uh, yeah set in stone yet. Yeah, who knows? It's it's not really clear of it uh, from from the Wikipedia, so I won't speculate. But it, it, right. I am I am at least uh, glad to see that 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 detail held true. Um, right. I don't I don't see Okitsu on the uh, total like for for any of the competitors though. Right. 
I know, because he's an animated character. I was just <laughs> trying to make you uncomfortable and confused. Um, no, 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 I hear you. All right, no, do you I... want to move on to Fastest Finger first? I would love to. All right, so this is uh, episode five of Fastest Finger First. Um, so the mystery girl with the blonde pigtails has lost her book, and Koshiyama has it. Uh, and separately, he, he ends up going to a joint practice that they are going to have with Miura. Um, Miura has brought buzzers so that they can actually have a team competition. Um, a, except Mikuria, the ace of Miura, is sitting out. Um, Sasajima is glad that they're you know learning more about the competition, and ultimately uh, they're not able to win so buzo loses by one point to miura uh but they do learn a lot more about how to operate as a team uh the big revelation at the end is that uh the mystery girl with the pigtails is sasajima's sister even though she's osakan and he's not it's not really clear clear how they're related (laughs) Uh, but he says yes she is evidently my sister and also uh apparently she has a passion for circuits and has decided that she wants to build um some buzzers for the quiz team herself so right. she's going to cool so uh i i thought this was generally a, a decently fun episode uh I, I thought the quiz uh the quiz game itself was mostly pretty enjoyable to watch like i, I don't know i i the the series like sports series tend to sell me based off of you know how they display the competition and it's mm-hmm. like there's not actually much going on here because of course they're just like you know hitting buzzers and whatever uh but i don't know i i find it weirdly interesting like i find it strangely compelling to watch how they how this competition how they strategize this competition weirdly enough i, I don't know if i've actually like thought this through well enough but I, I think what what I like about it is that, and I've touched upon this in the past. I, I like that everybody on the team has like a distinct, like a distinguishable role. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's what's fun for me about it. Like, well, it yeah, is- like there's there's that moment where Fukami buzzes in without knowing the answer, but she knows the subject. And she, right. so she knows that she's going to buzz quickly to give Koshiyama the chance to think about an answer. Um, and right. he's able to make an educated guess. Right, exactly. And, and I think that it, it's kind of watching that strategy evolve and realizing that they can kind of rely on one another. You know, it's kind of, it's sort of establishing the rules for how the series is going to go forward. Mm-hmm. And doing it in a low stakes environment. Right, exactly. And, and I think low stakes is always like the important thing. Like, I think a lot of series, they want to start with like a big, big game. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, that really means a lot. And, uh... Because you know that you you know you want to get people in you know at the height of emotions, but I really appreciate it when series kind of take like a low key approach to kind of establishing character relationships and like the rules of the game. Uh, I think that was actually like a fault that All Out had, and I think that's part of the reason why it didn't really like work so well at the beginning, but why it started working later on. And I appreciate the fact that the series is sort of taking the time now to sort of like keep the stakes low so that we can kind of watch the characters grow. Hmm. Um, I also appreciate that these guys are just gigantic dorks and that the series makes no, like, qualms about it. Um, you know, I, I, one of the things I really like about a lot of sports series is how they can get into the details. And one of the things I really love is that when Sasajima is talking with the, uh, with the captain of, uh, Miura High School, you can hear in the background the characters just making buzzing noises. <laughs> uh, because they're so excited that they actually have the opportunity to play with buzzers. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and you know, it's just kind of like, and I think it's moments like that that really kind of sell me on a series. It's like, okay, these are guys who are just really passionate and really excited just to be playing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, can we mention briefly the fact that um, Sasajima's sister, otherwise known as Jinko, right. uh is referred to at the end by Inoue as one of those gap moe low energy otaku, <laughs> which 
sure is a lot of words. <laughs> right. It, like, that's almost too long to be a phrase. Yeah. Uh, we, we were chatting about this a little bit before. I, I think uh, what I had said was, like, I'm pretty sure that they don't have a... Like, Crunchyroll doesn't have, like, their main, like, squad, almost. I, like, they're... I don't, I don't agree with that. Like, I think it's just an impossible phrase to translate in a way that makes sense. I, I don't know. I, I think you could go like, oh, she's like, she's like a circuit junkie or something like that. You know, something that makes, it doesn't necessarily, because a lot of translation work, it's not about like being a literal translation so much as it is adapting it. Uh, and I don't know. I, I feel like you could have. They could have done something a little bit more. This like that sort of uh, phrasing just felt like it was too literal of a translation. Mm. I, I don't know. That that's kind of why well, I got. Well, I the the reason that I kind of like it is, um, and I, I disagree with you completely as I always do. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I disagree with you partly um, right. because I I like the fact that. Inoue uses these terms that make no sense because he's like the dude who's super into idol culture and like, oh. a super big otaku. So right. like this is sort of the the same way when they were talking about what was it absolute territory, right? Um, that he would use this term that he's super confident in and like some portion of the fan base will understand, but he'll have to explain to Koshiyama. Um, so I, I kind of like the fact that he, he's speaking in this way that's supposed to not necessarily even be easy for a Japanese audience to understand. Okay. Um, so that, because that's just how he talks, right? Okay. okay. Um, admittedly that's damper, dampered, dampened. What's a word? It's <laughs> made less good-ish. Uh, by, uh, <laughs> by the fact that they end the episode on that. So because that's sort of like the big reveal at the end, whatever, um, the big reveal is uh, this girl likes circuitry, um, right. and, uh, that they didn't have an opportunity for him to explain what a gap moe low energy otaku means to right. Koshiyama. Um, which I assume will happen, like, the first line of the next episode. Right. Well, possibly. Because I kind of figured that this episode would would have just sort of followed suit from, like, last episode and kind of delve more into uh, into uh, Fukami's whole, like, freak out. And, like, yeah, the, this episode just kind of chose to ignore that, which I'm not yeah. super thrilled about. But, you know, I'm also... You know, I'm also still enjoying the ride. Um, what other... Yeah. Yeah, I'm. I also recognize that you know, tenth graders have a tendency to be like, oh, "I have feelings," and then <laughs> want to pretend it never happened, you know, right. or be confused and just not bring it up for a while. Right. So, like, I don't I mean, know if that's bad storytelling or true to life. <laughs> well, because I th I think it's a balance, right? Like, because I think some anime they use high school sort of. Like, in a general sense, like, this is the setting, but these characters are adults, effectively. Mm -hmm. Like, even if they are school-aged, like, the, they, you are to treat them as any other adult. Yeah. Um, who well, yeah, I mean, the main, yeah, the main characters of Gundam Wing were 16 years old. Right. <laughs> like, that, even, even at the time, that didn't make sense to me. Right, exactly. But, you know, there, there are some anime that do that, um... Sometimes it, but you know, then you get other series like this one where it does feel like it is trying to portray a more down to earth view of like high school, and I kind of feel so. I think in that regard, I think it kind of like I I don't necessarily have a problem with them being like, oh, you know, like you know, she's kind of freaking out about her own feelings. Like that makes sense for somebody in tenth grade for the world that this show is portraying. You know, in a world where high school students are actually like. Not high school students. Yeah. Can I just say one one more thing that I appreciate about the characterization of Fukami? And then we yeah, can sure. move on. Um, there was a couple points where she buzzed in and then uh, first Inoue answered the, the dice question. Right. Um, and then Koshiyama answered the, the classic question the Chinese classics question. Right. But it was all after she had buzzed in early. Right. Um, and so there was an opportunity where she could say like, Oh, both of it, it basically as she started, she's like, these guys are both new to quiz bowl, but you know, they're the ones who ended up saving me. 
and that could have gone one of two ways it could have been like like i'm so jealous or like how are they overcoming me or like what's wrong with them um but no she was the bigger person and she was like i sure am lucky to have people who can help me out so she was like legitimately thankful she didn't resent them like we didn't throw in like fake pointless drama right. um just like i gotta be the best no she was like oh uh, i'm glad i have a good team and right. so I, I appreciated them avoiding some really uninteresting drama uh when right. they very easily could have Right, and I kind of appreciate that too. I kind of appreciate the fact that it was Fukami who kind of got the character growth. Because, I, like, for example, you know, I'm actually going to call out a series that we both deeply, deeply love. Uh, Baby Steps, for example. Mm -hmm. Which is, I, I think, the closest uh, the closest comparison I, like to another series I can think of for uh, Fastest Finger. Yep. Uh, like, for example, in that series, uh, Natsu is very, like... She is her own defined character, but she is also sort of her own character in the sense of how she is related to uh, Ichiro, if mm. that makes any sense. like Yeah, she doesn't of... get her own development for a while. Right, and it's like, in a lot of these types of shows, like, the, the sort of, like, the female lead generally doesn't get their own development, it feels mm -hmm. like, but I kind of appreciate the fact that you know, it's like, Fukami's not sort of this distant character from the rest of the cast. No, she is, like, right there with them in the in the meat of it. You know, she's she's down there fighting with them. And I, can, and I appreciate that. Um, one small other thing I just want to acknowledge here as well. There there was one one small funny bit. I, I That was kind of a nice little character building moment for Sasajima as well. Was that uh, when he's revealing the fact that... Uh, that somehow Jinko is his sister. But, in, you know, everybody's like, wait, but she has a Kansai accent. And he sort of is like, well, y'all... And he has this sort of <laughs> enunciated, <laughs> well, y'all, like... It, it almost feels like it, this is... I, I wasn't really quite sure what the gleam for that, but I thought it was kind of funny because it's like, okay, so is he trying to, like... Is he trying to hide the fact that he himself is from Kansai? You know, he's kind of trying to get uh -huh. rid of his, his sort of hick tone, as it were. Uh -huh. uh, or is this, like, him just sort of, like, poking fun of the fact that it's like, yeah, guess what, we are somehow related by blood, like, like, I, I don't know, I thought, I thought the, uh, his use of y'all was strangely funny for Sasajima. Oh, also the fact that apparently he carries a bo broken buzzer with him at all times. Yeah, he's got a feeling of a buzzer. He's got to train his finger so he always knows the feeling of, uh, buzzing in, which impresses nobody yes. but Fukami. <laughs> Um, speaking of something that impresses nobody, would you like to talk about, uh, Clean Freak Ayamakun? <laughs> that is, I think, maybe your best transition. Well, golly, alright, I'll put it at like... the top of the leaderboard. <laughs> okay, so in episode 5 of Clean Freak, uh, the, uh, the main team is playing against, uh, Min Minamita Fujoku, uh, Actually, the captain of this team, or the sort of the star player of this team, uh, Ryo, was actually a former uh, teammate of uh, Sukamoto back from his uh, high school days, or junior high school days. Who's Sukamoto? And uh, Sukamoto is the guy with glasses who always bounces the ball on his butt. Yeah. Um, who is apparently the heart, or like the laughter of the team. He's the one who is always raising everybody's spirits mm -hmm. because of his hilarious gag. Um, and what we find out is that Tsukamoto has really got, like, some sort of trauma uh, due to uh, Ryo's sort of uh, bullying of him back in junior high. Because, guess what? Uh, Ryo found his joking around annoying. And thus sort of, like, isolated him. Uh, but uh, Aoyama decides to sort of throw the game for a little bit so that Tsukamoto can finally stand up to Ryo... And finally get, like, kind of work through his trauma so that he can become an even better player than he was before. Right. And then after that, Aoyama decides to start, like, working... Like, he starts actually playing for the first time, and they manage to win, like, handily. Yeah. Um, so this episode sucked. Yeah, it wasn't good, no. Yeah, no, it was bad. Uh, I... This... I can't decide if this episode or last episode were worse. Last episode worse. was I, I worse. Feel, I don't know. I, I felt like this episode was more... Ob like, last episode was more pointless. This one was more obnoxious. Mm. Um, just because... Uh, 
this show does not know how to make a funny joke. Like, I, I, I don't know how else to put it. It doesn't know how to be funny, and that's bad for a comedy series. Because the entire gag, like, there is no other gag about Tsukamoto using the ball, or using his butt to bounce the ball, beyond, oh, look, he's bouncing the butt with, the ball with his butt. Yeah, like, I mean... isn't this a hilarious gag? Don't you see how super deformed he becomes when he does that? Yeah. Oh, my, it's just, it's such an obnoxious trait of this show. And not only, and it's like, and I hate... The fact, because uh, towards the end of the episode when Aoyama, like, he kind of gives uh, Tsukamoto a, a pass, like, he gives him, like, a cross pass, essentially, and Tsukamoto's like, oh no, what do I do? Uh, and then Aoyama is, tells him, you know, you know, do what he always does, and so what does he do? He knocks the ball into the goal with his butt. Yeah, apparently Aoyama just chose to place the ball perfectly so that he could hit it with his butt, because that was going to, like help him overcome his trauma from bullying uh the uh and i think what bothers me the most is that you know there's something like five minutes left in the game at this point um (laughs) and with that butt goal they managed to tie the game and then uh off screen aoyama scores two more goals in less than five minutes uh, right. Well, without naturally, any because explanation, he, got, he can go all yeah, out. Yeah, exactly. They're like, well, you just couldn't stop Aoyama at the end there. So what that tells you is that he spent the whole game intentionally not scoring because he knew the only way for Sakamoto to co- to overcome his trauma was to score a butt goal. Uh, <sighs> yeah. Because he has to be true to himself, man. Yeah, because that's, that's... That's his soccer. His butt that, soccer. Uh, oh my God. Yeah. Just, Why are we talking about it, this? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, uh, it, it's, w- w- what's, what's becoming increasingly clear is this show isn't about soccer, and it's not even really about Ayama. It's about every character getting an episode and introducing new and unrelated and unnecessary characters getting their own episodes where you get to see them run into some situation and then Aoyama will use his magic brain powers to intuit the perfect response and then he will save them and allow them to be their true selves. And we're going to do this for seven more weeks. You know, it's really bad, too, when, like, a character has such a sympathetic, like, reasoning, like, you know, Tsukamoto, you know, being bullied throughout all throughout junior high from this captain guy. And, you know, you come out of the episode like, yeah, I kind of sympathize with Ryo there. Yeah, exactly. It's like, yeah, no, that is incredibly obnoxious and adds nothing. Like, maybe he took it too yeah, far. Yeah, but, like, yeah, you can't necessarily endorse, like, oh, you probably should have kicked him in the face. Good idea. Um, <laughs> but you can understand why a guy who literally just bounces a soccer ball on his butt every day and says, look at me, guys, uh, would not necessarily be helping the team improve. <laughs> <laughs> but no, but it's apparently super important to the team because it lifts their spirits because it's such a hilarious guy. Yeah, I don't get it. How I... do you do that every day for multiple years and still have people freak out about it? You know, <sighs> I, it's like... I, I don't think 16-year-olds are that easily impressed like you know right. the first couple times sure but if you're just doing the same thing every day eventually they're gonna get tired of it it's like you need new material dude yeah. like and i guess they did have a sequence where they were kind of showing that where the, like the guy is tossing him soccer balls and he's trying to not and you know it's like oh he missed with the he missed and so he used his butt technique accidentally and it's like <sighs> yeah yeah th- are we really trying to justify this um there is one other just small moment I want to point out in this episode as well, is that when Tsukamoto is sort of sulking after the first half when he's in the bathroom, like, you have this sort of dramatic moment, like, you know, he's just sort of there depressed by himself, and then the series just briefly, like, has him overexcitedly, like, unroll the toilet paper in, like, that stupid, like, chibi, super deformed mode. With cat ears. And with cat ears. And then he's just right back to sulking, like, almost immediately afterwards. And it's like, this show does not even know how to hang on a dramatic moment without making a stupid joke. <laughs> yeah. Like, 
like, I just... Can you just decide what you want to be? Like, this feels like... what Like, what the series feels like to me. Um... This feels like a series that has been, like, that has already gone through a major plot arc. Like, you've already seen Yeah, like, this is the, the filler. The story. Like, this is all the filler. This is, like, like I- I'm sorry to say this because I actually like this manga, but, like, it reminds me a lot of Lovely Complex, if you remember reading that yeah. one, dude. Uh, like... Like, the last, like, seven volumes of that where it's just sort of reaching for plot and it's just sort yeah, of dude, like... Yeah, I kind of uh, gave one... up at the end, to be honest. <laughs> like, Lo- Lovecom was great until they were just sort of hanging out aimlessly. Yeah, exactly. And that's what the series feels like. It just feels like them hanging out aimlessly without any sort of real structure or, like, goal here. And again, that's, that's okay goal. for a comedy series. <laughs> um, yeah, well, uh, the 20-year veteran of high school soccer photography certainly thought that Aoyama couldn't keep up his <laughs> kindness. Because, um, yeah, at, at one point there's these two photographers. So, like, point number one, there are multiple newspapers that need daily photographs of Aoyama. Uh, yeah, well, naturally, Matt. He's a really big deal. He's really handsome. Haven't you seen the t-shirts? No Aoyama, no wife. <laughs> yeah, that's that's something that is in the show. Um, but yeah. there is this this veteran photographer who's telling his uh, younger counterpart that, well, I don't know if if Aoyama really spent the whole game just waiting so that he could help his friend then he's a bigger idiot than you can imagine and he'll never make the national team um it's like (laughs) oh you know so clearly he will you know there you go show prove prove that old man and his cynicism wrong you know and that's what's so frustrating to me too is that the series can't even like now we're kind of getting the central conflict here is that oyama is Working through his problems through this team is what I'm getting. Yeah. Or, like, he, like, Aoyama's role is, like, like the dynamic of this team is that they all want to keep Aoyama or else he's going to have to leave to pursue his soccer career. But Aoyama does want to stay with this team because he cares about them deeply. You couldn't have just shown us that? Like, you had, like, this was five episodes and you n- have just now decided to just sort of lay that out for us. Thanks, Captain Photographer. Mm-hmm. Uh... And one other thing, uh, just to point out super briefly, the other infidelity moment in this episode was this inc- incredibly pointless plot about uh, the team captain Gaku is apparently part of the Aoyama fan club because his girlfriend is part of it. Oh, yeah. And it's like, because she tells him, like, oh, you know, there's nobody else I love but you, Gaku, while holding, like, an I love Aoyama. The only reason I bring it up is because it spends, like, five minutes going into this, and it builds up to nothing. Yeah, exactly. There's no, there's, it's, it's a hilarious gag, man. That's why. Uh, it's super funny. It's like, and that's what this feel- series feels like to me. It's just constantly trying to tell us that it's funny, and it's not. It's just stupid and annoying. Okay, okay. Um, okay, the, uh... I want to talk about something that's not stupid and annoying. Okay. So, big wind up, episode <laughs> eighteen. Is that the right number? Uh, I believe okay, so. Good. Yes, uh, that's what I have written right, down. I know. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> so it starts where we left off at the bottom of the fourth. Um, Mahashi is, uh, or is still you know pitching. And there's runner on third who's still freaked out by Mahashi looking at him all the time. Um, ultimately, he's able to induce a pop out and end the inning. Um, so Abe, when they get around, so Mahashi's going to bat first, and Abe actually tells him that uh, he should just strike out so that he doesn't waste time on the base paths. He needs to focus on pitching. Um, and, right. of course, when you, if you tell Mahashi you should fail or else, uh, he gets emotional and confused. Um, so he did, <laughs> and then Abe says, oh, never mind, I was just kidding. Swing for the fences. Um of course, what happens is that Mahashi actually gets hit by a pitch. Uh, Abe freaks out. How dare he get hit by a pitch? Um, and then Mahashi <laughs> is able to steal steal second because uh, Tajima has figured out some of the, the pickoff move for the uh, opposing pitcher, Junta. Um, ultimately, uh, Mahashi is able to come all the way around to third. And at the end of the episode, they perform a surprise squeeze bunt. 
um, and Mihashi scores. So now, by the end of the episode, uh, the inning still isn't over, and Nishira is up 2-0 in the top of the fifth. Right. Um, so, I, I thought what was kind of interesting about this one is that there was the sort, like, there was more of a conflict in this one than I feel like there have been in past episodes because of the fact that Mihashi is sort of unexpectedly performing well. Um, you know, and this it might actually end up being detrimental to the team, but, you know, in the moment, they don't realize that. Yeah, exactly, because he's exerting himself a lot. And so it's clearly, it's affecting him on some level, but no one's really sure whether he's okay or not yet. Right. Right, and not only that, but it's like, you know, obviously, like, Momo doesn't want to, like, like, call him off the base or, you know, because she's like, no, I see an opportunity for a run, I'm going to make him go for it. Like, he actually gets the, he actually gets on base, we're going to make use of this. Mm -hmm. Uh, But, you know, it's like, there is this sort of, we're starting to see this sort of divide in the team without uh, really realizing it. Uh, Because... uh, because, you know, Abe, you know, he clearly, you know, he understands Mihashi better than anybody else. But, you know, Momoe wants to, uh, you know, she just wants to keep, you know, she wants to kind of keep the team going. You know, she wants to keep this momentum going before it sort of falls apart. Well, yeah, and it's not really clear which one of them is right yet. Because, right. you know, based on how the series works, you figure that Abe is always going to be the one who intuits correctly. Um but right. that's not necessarily the case, and he's actually been, it, it, he's shown himself capable of making mistakes or being, like, overly protective of Mahashi or whatever. You know, he completely freaks out when Mahashi gets hit, but Mahashi actually says, like, nah, I ain't, it doesn't hurt, I'm, I'm okay, they, they hit me in the butt, I'm fine. Um, <laughs> more, more butt stuff in this episode, gosh. Um, <laughs> but... So, I, I don't know. I am kind of looking forward to who, seeing who's right because... And that that's part of the reason, too, that they can't afford to um, really do anything to, like, put a, another runner on in place of Mahashi or to conserve his strength is because they only have two other guys who are even capable of pitching. They only have one other guy who's sitting on the bench that they have some flexibility with, and they so they really right. need to hold onto their cards because they can't they can't pull mihashi out until he's absolutely not gonna be effective anymore right but at the same time this entire game has acted like it's sort of in like small ways but you're like throughout this game you're seeing how much the team is relying on mihashi because like every major play in this game has been solely due to mihashi like like that sort of miraculous out that they got at oh, home yeah. that you know sort of began this episode like like you know that was Mihashi like having the the foresight to run ahead and grab the ball like both the runs were me Miha- were pretty much due to Mihashi mm-hmm. uh the first time because he sort of faked out the uh he faked out the pitcher and tried to steal base and like which gave uh I forget who was running home at the time but managed to get him to run home so that he didn't get picked off mm-hmm. Uh, now, Mihashi was the one who had managed to steal home. And on one hand, you can kind of see how the rest of the team is building up onto this, because Tajima was the one who noticed the pitcher's, uh, uh, like, he noticed how his muscles were tensing yeah. when he was going to do a pickoff, or when he was going to actually throw a, uh, a throw a pitch. Uh, so, you know, that's actually made him very susceptible to stealing. But at the same time, Mihashi has been involved in all this, so the series is sort of building up this sort of dependency on Mihashi, and you don't really, really see it in the moment, but you can also see, like, when he gets hit, you know, with that ball, how that could end up being a huge issue because he's been so involved in all of these events. Mm-hmm. The other the other thing I liked was there was a lot of cat and mouse between Momoe and Tosei's coach. Uh, just right. in they were constantly trying to feel each other out and figure out what strategy the other one was going for. And so right. they, it's kind of like a silent back and forth where they were just doing sm- making small adjustments and changing their signs and doing a couple things to try and outmaneuver the other. And so if you're following right. along, it's it's actually that that's one of the more dramatic things is seeing how they're trying to guess each other's logic and figure out each other's assumptions based on small clues and then capitalize right. on it. And ultimately, Momoe wins by. Call it, she she doesn't call for a squeeze bunt 
when he think when the opponent thinks that she's going to, and then she waits right. until it like it looks like she'd have to be an idiot to do a squeeze bunt, and that's when she does it because that's when they're not expecting it anymore. Right. Which is interesting, too, because that was sort of a style of anime that we don't get so much anymore, because that was actually something that was very much of the time, because when did we figure... This was, like, 2007. 2000, yeah, 2007. Like, this was around the time when stuff like when Akagi was getting popular, when Death Note was getting big. Like, this whole, oh, like, yeah. sort of, like, mental back and forth, this was actually a very popular style that I'm actually kind of sad to see go, because... It works very well in, like, I would say better in sports anime. Mm -hmm. uh, just having that sort of down to earth feel because it feels very natural and it and it kind of it's and that's literally how of, baseball works. So like that's what a baseball right, show like, should be. Like they're not making anything up about yeah. it. Like, like no, that's literally just how the game works. Mm -hmm. um, and so there is this sort of interesting sort of mental power fantasy that comes from yeah. it. Um, and so, you know, I am kind of sad to, sad to see that it's not, that, like, Big Wind Up to me is sort of, like, I, I sort of miss this old style of anime, but Big Wind Up, I think, was probably one of the best of those anyway. Mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, it was, it was a good week, though. Um, I, Yeah, good I, week all around. I, yeah, I mean, aside from, aside from Ayama, but that's a given. <laughs> true enough, true enough. Anyway. Cool. So yeah, I, I think we're pretty much wrapping up here today. Uh, just one quick thing, please, if you want to submit a cu uh, question of the week, just uh, send us an email at uh, koshiancast at gmail.com. Uh, so if Matt, would you please hit the credits? All right. Our logo design is by James Radcliffe. The theme music is Fly High by Burnout Syndromes, covered and performed by Luke Bartka. You can follow Koshiancast on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, and our email is koshiancast at gmail.com. Make sure to subscribe, rate, and review. We will be back next week with the best and worst from the world of sports anime, and until then, keep training.